Hey, it's uh, good to see you here, and it's uh, just uh, really lovely to see families here and um, uh, come to uh, celebrate with your mum or, um, yeah, just to honour your mum. And I tr trust that uh, uh, as we think of Mother's Day that um, we do just don't... Uh, think of uh, our mums on just on Mother's Day, that we think of about them every day of the week and thank God for them. Let's, um, let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you for your word and uh, we are just excited uh, by the truth in it. And uh, Lord, we just pray that as we look into your word this, this morning that you might uh, speak into our hearts and challenge us, but encourage us and inspire us that we want to be more like you. So bless our time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I really uh, love this passage. Um, it might seem an obscure passage to you, but I just absolutely love this passage. Uh, and, you know, one of the reasons I love this passage is that the more I look at the character of Nehemiah, uh, the more you realize that he was a man for his time, uh, that God had raised up such a godly example to uh, the people of Israel. Uh, this is what a leader should be like. Uh, last week we saw how uh, there was an uprising in the, in the ranks, uh, there was inequality. Some Jews' uh, own uh, countrymen were, were ripping one another off. Uh, the poorer brothers and sisters uh, couldn't afford to pay their bills. Uh, they were violating the, the law of, of God, the law that specifically said that you were to help your poorer brother, not rip them off. Uh, you weren't to charge them interest. You weren't to sell them into slavery. In fact, God's people uh, had become a laughing stock to the other nations around them. Instead of becoming distinct, uh, behaving differently, they had uh, uh, become just like the other nations around them, just as selfish, just as greedy, uh, just like them. And you know, as I think about that society that they lived in, I think that uh, we are not too much, uh, not too different in our society today. The pursuit of money and possessions is, is something that consumes our society, doesn't it? We build uh, bigger and bigger shopping malls for people to shop, shop in. In fact, I, I think uh, it is uh, quickly becoming society's most popular pastime, going to the shops, going to the shopping mall. In fact, the, the shopping malls are the temples within our society. That is where everyone gathers. That is where everyone meets. We live in a society where uh, materialism and consumerism reign. Uh, people mortgage themselves up to the hilt in order to have a flasher house, a, a better car, uh, the latest new contraption that's just been uh, put on the market. We become indebted to our, our banks and uh, lending institutions and have to work harder and harder just to pay off the debt. In a sense, we are not too different from the society uh, of Nehemiah's day. Maybe it's uh, not fellow Christians ripping one another off, but in a way we have been captivated by the world's values. What is, what is it that uh, makes uh, uh, us different uh, than the society in which we live? What makes you different? Uh, what sets you apart as a Christian? Uh, what is it that makes a church different than the local bowling club or the local golf club or the, or, or the local Lions club? Are we any different? You know, Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2 says this. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, 
by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as living sacrifices acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect. John says this in, in 1 John 2, 15 and 16. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then it says this, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. You know, Jesus said in, in John 17 that we are to be in the world, but not of it. You know, Nehemiah, in this situation, he confronts uh, uh, the situation head on. He, he confronted those who were charging high interest rates, who were ripping off their fellow Jew, and, and he really called them to repent. He says, stop what you are doing. Pay back uh, those whom you have ripped off and, and, uh, and pr make a promise before God that you are going to change. But there's another thing that uh, Nehemiah did that I didn't mention last week that I just find really staggering. Nehemiah became an example to other leaders and to the people in general on how to live and how to lead. And it's this that I want to speak about this morning. You see, in this passage we just read, Nehemiah is promoted to uh, governor of the prov province of Judah. He, he's the top man in the area, and he's been there for 12 years. You know, to me, it's, it's no coincidence that uh, Nehemiah puts these six verses immediately after the crisis uh, that he had just found himself in. Uh, you see, those who are ripping off the people were the, were the leaders. And in this case, uh, the leadership had influence and they had money. Uh, they, they called the shots and, uh, and the people they aimed at, uh, they ripped off. They ripped off their own brothers and sisters. Nehemiah sets himself up as a role model uh, on, uh, as to how one should live and behave as a leader within that sort of society. How one is to take responsibility. Now, whether you are a manager of a company or a father or mother in the home, whether you are the oldest family member or whether you are a, a pastor or a deacon or an elder in the church, Nehemiah sets a standard. He sets the example by which we are called to live by. And I want to look at some principles this morning uh, by which Nehemiah conducted himself. And the first thing he did, he didn't demand his rights. He didn't demand his rights. Look at verse 14. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. Now, with the governorship came sort of uh, privileges as well as responsibility. The privilege of being the governor of Judah was that you got a food allowance, perhaps for entertaining. For 12 years, Nehemiah, as well as his family, never took advantage of that. Never took advantage of that privilege. And I find that incredible. I get a food allowance here. And uh, sometimes I take advantage of it. Well, I, <laughs> I uh, get what I deserve, I suppose. This is a, but this is in direct contrast to the nobles and the rulers of the land that he had uh, just dealt with. Uh, these men... Uh, these nobles in that used their power, used their position to get what they wanted for themselves. They acted no differently from the world around them. 
Uh, moreover, they, they even took advantage of their fellow Jew. They, they ripped them off. You know, it's, it's so easy for us to live like the world in these areas of life. To demand our rights, to demand our privileges as if the world owes us a living. Everyone else does it, so why not me? That's what we say. And so the firm's car or the expense account, we can easily take advantage of and use in a way that we wouldn't want our car or our credit card used. As husbands, as fathers, it's easy to take advantage of the, of the privileged position that we have in the home and expect everyone to jump to our beck and call. We can easily demand the best of everything and think uh, that we can do what we want. You know, Paul in Ephesians uh, speaks of relationships between a husband and a wife and children and parents and employees and, uh, and employers. Uh, but before he launches into how we should relate to each other, in Ephesians 5.21 he says, And be subject to one another in the fear of the Lord. We're all to be subject to one another. Nehemiah here uh, knew that he was quite entitled to these privileges. He, he could have uh, lived in the uh, lap of luxury like his, his predecessors had. Well, that was his position. That's what his position entitled him to have, but he never accepted it. In fact, if you look at Daniel, Daniel did the same. He was offered the king's choice for food, but chose vegetables and water. He chose not to be entrapped, entrapped in, a, in a life of luxury, even though he could have. And what happened? God blessed Daniel and his friends. You see, the opportunity might be there to have a, a lifestyle of luxury. The opportunity uh, might be there to, to increase your standard of living. But we need to be very, very careful about that. Careful that our lifestyles don't become a hindrance to what God wants us to be. Careful that our lifestyles don't become a, a hindrance to serving others and a, means, uh, and a means of difference in the family of God. You know, it's very sad when you see inequality within the church. To see the haves and the have-nots. You see, those who are in positions of authority in a place of, of, of wealth or influence need to guard against that, as Nehemiah did, not demand our rights. So that's the first thing. He didn't demand his rights. Secondly, he didn't lord it over the people, verse 15. Look at verse 15. The former governors who were uh, before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them uh, for their daily rations 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of the Lord. You see, those before Nehemiah, the rulers of the land, took advantage of their authority. Look what they did. They they overtaxed people. They laid burdens on them. They took perks. They, they took bread and wine and shekels of silver from them, uh, probably illegally. They, they promoted their servants to a place of domineering leadership. That is, there was cronyism. And isn't that exactly what we see in the world today? We see it in politics. We see it in big business. We are overtaxed. We are, uh, see people with, with influence, with the, their snouts and the, and the public trough, collecting their perks. We see jobs for the boys. Don't be surprised. This is what the world does. We see it in the scriptures too, don't we? Remember James and John wanted important positions in the kingdom of heaven? They wanted to sit on the right and, and left of Jesus. Uh, and when the other uh, disciples heard uh, about this, they were indignant, probably because they never thought of it themselves. 
And Jesus, seeing what happened, pointed to the world and basically said, your actions are no different than the world. Mark 8, 10, 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall, it shall not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, the rulers of Israel before Nehemiah were no different from the world in which they lived. They got into this position of power. They lorded it over the people they were responsible for. Listen to Peter's advice to elders, but it's a principle of, of leadership, not just for elders, but for anyone. 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. This is what a father should do. This is what an elder should do, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Lording it over those whom you are responsible for is not God's way of exercising authority. And it was not Nehemiah's either. Look what Nehemiah says at the end of verse 15. But I did not do so because of the fear of the Lord. He said, I didn't exercise authority like my predecessors because I feared God. You see, Nehemiah knew he was under a higher authority. He was under the Lord's authority. He was responsible uh, to the Lord for his actions. If you've been given responsibility, if you've been given authority over others, whether it be as a, a mother or a father or a foreman or a teacher or, or whatever, be careful how you exercise that authority because you have to account to a higher authority to the Lord himself for your actions. Nehemiah didn't behave like the former rulers did. He feared the Lord. And we must too. Well, Nehemiah, he, he uh, uh, didn't demand his rights. He, he didn't lord it over people. And thirdly, Nehemiah focused on the task. Look at verse 16. I also persevered in the work on this wall. And we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. He focused on the task. This wall should have been built long ago, but the leaders seem to have been sidetracked. But not Nehemiah. Not Nehemiah. He continued to apply himself to the, the building of the wall, to what God had uh, uh, called him to do, despite the, 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 the crises that he found himself in. Now, have you noticed when some people get a promotion at work or wherever, they often get sidetracked from where God wants them to be? They come home late from work so they don't have as much time with their family or are, are unable to get to Bible study. Have you noticed that? They leave earlier to work so they miss out on their quiet times in the morning. They become less available to doing what God wants them to be. That's what happens. Moreover, when some people earn more, they start to look at things where they can invest their newfound wealth. Uh, uh, very few can handle uh, much money, much authority. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10, he says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful uh, desires, and plunge people into ruin and destru destruction. It's terrible. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It, it is through the craving, this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and, and pierced themselves with many pangs. Isn't that so true? 
It's not money that we should be pursuing, but Paul says it should be righteousness, godliness, faith, and love. And where do we find those things? We find them in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Nehemiah. He didn't buy land and, and all his servants worked like everyone else. He didn't get uh, sidetracked by worldly pursuits, but he focused on what God had called him to do, to build the wall, even in spite of the crisis that he faced. And you know, Jesus did the same as well. We're told that he had nowhere to lay his head. Didn't buy land. He kept pursuing the goal that, that God had called him to do. He set his face to go to Jerusalem where he would die on a cross for us. Christian leadership is like that. It's focused on the task ahead. It's focused on what God has called us to do. In raising godly families. Serving the church. Lastly, fourthly, Christian leadership is servant leadership. Look at this amazing verse, verse 17 and 18. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us, now, what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet all of this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because of the service was too heavy on this people. Can you see how he served others? You see how he served others? Look at the numbers of people that were around his place for a meal. Imagine that, 150. He prepared meals for, even after a busy day. Yes, he probably had his servants and cooks and, and people to prepare the meal, but wouldn't you think he would have got sick and tired of these people hanging around his place each night, especially after a hard day's work? Christian leadership is servant leadership. It's servant leadership. We lead by serving, not by lording it over people, by serving. Again, we catch up on what Jesus said in Mark 10, 45. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus did. You know, I think one of the reasons there's so much loneliness in our society is because we don't have servant hearts anymore. You can never run out of people to serve. You can never run out of people to give hospitality to. Somebody said to me not so long ago, do Kiwis not give hospitality anymore? You know, my father was a solo dad. Uh, my mum died when I was three, and dad had seven kids to drag up. And uh, it was nothing for our family as a kid to have eight to ten people around in the weekend for meals. Our place was wall-to-wall -wall people. These days we are far too busy. Look what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 8 to 10. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality uh, to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. That's what Peter said. Listen to what Paul said. Romans 12, 10 to 13, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This is what Nehemiah did. 
that is the example that Jesus set as well, and it's an example that we must set. Servant leadership is the mark of true Christian leadership. Nehemiah, he didn't demand his rights. He, he didn't lord it over people. He, he focused on what God called him to do, of building the wall, and he served others. His actions reflect Christ's likeness. His actions set an example to the people he was leading. His actions speak uh, to us in the church today, doesn't it? Doesn't it? The principles that uh, Nehemiah lived by are God's principles. They are timeless principles lived out by ne Nehemiah, lived out by the Lord Jesus Christ. They are principles that you and I need in our own lives. Like Christ, we are to give up our rights and humble ourselves and be servants to those around us. Like Christ, we uh, are to be prepared to, to suffer for righteousness' sake and to give our lives as a ransom for many. Friends, this is the cross-centered life. This is the, uh, what our Lord has done for us. He looked past his own interest and then gave his life as a ransom for us. Nehemiah did that. And look how this uh, passage finishes in verse 19. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Remember me, O oh my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. You know, when we do what God has called us to do, we too will be remembered. And we will hear his voice say to us at the end of our, our lives here on earth, well done, good and faithful friend. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this passage. We thank you for the principles that are written in your word that we can live by day by day in our lives. And I pray that uh, uh, we as your people would not demand you, our rights, that we would not seek to lord it over others, that we'd uh, uh, keep our, our, our focus on the gospel and sharing that. And Lord, that we'd be a servant people, reaching out, showing hospitality, caring for others. Help us to do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.